Welcome to the online ministry of Faith Christian Fellowship. FCF is a dynamic word and spirit empowered church where faith and family meet. If you would like more information about our church or other media resources, please visit us at faithchristianfellowship.com. We hope you enjoy this message. guys are blessed in this house. You guys are blessed to come into a house of freedom that nobody cares, any agenda, just get in the presence of the Lord. And whenever Stephen told me about what he's doing on these, these Sunday night services once a month with Crave, I thought to myself, why in the world is the Lord taking me here? You know, and then whenever I got here in worship, it all kind of came together. I came in uh, this evening and I said, Steve, I really don't have a clue where I'm going with this thing tonight. Uh, I'm just going to see what the Lord does and uh, and see where he takes us. But, but as worship progressed and uh, I started just thinking about the name Crave and I started thinking about the things that I used to do and the things that I used to crave in my life. And now... There's no other place, man, there's no other place that I would rather be than in the presence of Almighty God. Because when the glory shows up, that's when lives are changed and transformed forever. It's not just another service, it's not just a song, but the presence of Almighty God changes things. The word says mountains will melt like wax in the presence of God. And man, the Lord has done so much for me in my life. He's brought me so far. I'm 32 years old right now. And whenever I look back at my life, the things that I used to desire, I no longer have a desire for. I got addicted to drugs and alcohol. Just a short brief of who I am, what I'm about. Uh, uh, just for you, just for a recap, I wasn't even going to do this, but I believe the Lord's going to uh, use it tonight in this area. But uh I got into high school, I was raised, my, my lovely mother and father is here tonight, and I'm so thankful for, for praying parents and raising children up, uh, and, and I truly am a firm believer. If you train your children up, they're not going to depart from that way, uh, because I'm a true uh, testimony of that uh, in, in life form, because whenever I was raised, I was raised in church, we went to uh, New Life on the Mountain with Davy Joe Hissom. And I don't really remember much of it, but I know that the glory was falling all around. I know that I was sleeping under, under chairs, and I know that I was playing there, but there was something that deposited on the inside of my heart at that time at a young age. And that's why every time that I get near the presence of God, I want my son to be in the presence of God because I want my son to not know the things that I had to go through. I want my son to not have to do the things that I had to go through to find out the hard way. Uh, but I got in, I got into to middle school and high school, and I started straying away from, from the things that I was raised from. I got addicted to drugs and alcohol. It led me down to a path of being addicted to drugs and alcohol for 15 years of my life. I'm 32 years old. You know, eighth grade, I started, started dabbling in drugs and alcohol and, and different things, and it led to one thing to the next thing. Before I knew it, uh, I threw every scholarship opportunity that I had. Uh, I wrestled my whole life, and I, I pretty much just put every scholarship offer that I ever got, I put it in a shoebox, put it under my bed, and didn't even say anything to anybody about it because the only thing that I desired was my next high. My next drug, my next, my, next, my next drink, my next bar, my next thing that I could just do something to fill the void that, that I was really trying to search for the things of the Lord in that time. But I didn't know I was just filling that void in my life. So I started desiring things and I started craving these things. And as I sit here this evening, <coughs> it started making sense why I'm here. Because uh, one thing that I used to desire is drugs and alcohol. But now there's nothing that I would crave more than the presence of Almighty God, than just to sit uh, in His majesty and to sit in His glory and, and just let Him work and move. And uh, I'm just a firm believer that in His presence, everything changes. Because I, I tasted the goodness of God. And once I tasted the goodness of God, I've never been the same. 
once you taste the true presence, nothing else will satisfy. The bar down the street's not going to satisfy. The next drug that you try to put into your body, it's not going to satisfy. It's going to fill a void for a minute because it says sin is fun for a season, but it's never going to satisfy you and sustain you for the rest of your life. Uh, but this atmosphere, the presence of God will always get you to there. So as I started just studying into this crave, uh, the Lord just really placed the word desire into my heart. And I said, Lord, desire. I, I just want to desire you. I just want more of the Lord every single day that I wake up in my life. Because once, once you've tasted, man, ankle deep is not enough. Knee deep is not enough. Man, we're created for so much more. We're created to see the glory of the Lord be poured out onto this earth like the waters cover the seas. If you think about that passage of scripture, the water that covers the earth is effortless. So the glory of God that will be poured out in the last days, it should be effortless. But it comes through a plowing and it comes through a place that a people grabs a hold of it and says, God, we're going to contend for this thing until the glory covers the earth as the waters cover the sea. Amen. My son came into this world about a year ago, and ever since he came into this world, my life's changed radically. My life's, my whole perspective's changed uh, just because I know what I did and what I dealt with growing up through school. And, I, and there's just a mandate on my life to go after God with everything on the inside of me so my son never sees the things that I've seen in my life. So a needle never touches his arm like it did mine. So, it, so, so he don't snort something up his nose like I did mine. And I contend for the things of God to break that generational curse off of his life. And I've made a covenant with the Lord that I'm going to do everything in my might to blaze a trail for him. So the only thing that he knows is awakening. That the only thing that he knows is revival. That the only thing that he knows is how to pray and how to worship and how to usher in the presence of Almighty God. So as I sit there and I reflected this evening in worship and I thought, you know, to crave, absolutely. That's why I'm here because, Lord, that's what I want to do. I want to I crave you consistently every single day. Man, it's more to it than just one time encounter. It's more to it than just coming to a church on Sundays and Wednesdays and letting a pastor tell you uh, what you need to do. But it's time for us to start taking it on ourselves to not depend on a man or woman of God to feed us every single day. But we have to be equipped and we have to learn how to feed ourselves. Yeah, those men and women of God are placed in your life to, to challenge you on a weekly basis and to push you and to do things to you, the leaders that's placed in your life. But we have to learn that, hey, we got to take it upon ourselves and really start to open this word and to start to dig into the place of prayer and see where the Lord does and see where he takes us. Because there's so much more, so much more. And I'm so excited, man. It's, it's an honor to be here again. Uh, <coughs> but... I'm a, I'm a big definition guy. I love words. I love finding a word when the Lord points it out into the Bible. And, and I love just dissecting that thing. I love dissecting scripture just because this is life, man. This is the life. This is, this is how we figure out what we need to do, how we need to do it, when we need to do it. If you need a GPS to get you somewhere on the road, this is your GPS to get you somewhere in life. I've went down all the other roads that's led me nowhere. I should be dead. I should be in jail. Or I should be somewhere else not here tonight. But the grace of God pulled me out of that sin. Pulled me out of that muck and that mud. We're talking about almost half of my life I was addicted to drugs and alcohol. It makes no sense why the Lord is so gracious enough to say, I know where you was, but here, you're never too far for me to pull you out. And it's so good, but, but in this whole process of, of this craving and desire, to crave or des is to desire eagerly, to long for, or to want greatly. A lot of times we, 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 uh, we relate it to craving food, and we relate it to craving love. I know everybody in here has craved one of those two things, if not both of those two things at the same time. Right? 
So, so to crave and to desire eagerly, everybody knows, hey, when you drive past the Dairy Queen, for some reason, you start to crave a blizzard. Why? Because they're good, right? Yes. When you're going through high school, what, what, what are you desiring? You're desiring relationship. You're desiring love. When you're coming up and growing up and, and trying to find uh, your wife or your husband, you're desiring to find affection. The word says in Matthew 5, 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. It's no coincidence that, that the things that we place ourselves, the, the material things that we place ourselves around us and we think that they're so important at that time, it's all related to the word and to God. Because in 1 John it says, we love him because he first loved us. So there's a relation there to desire, to crave spiritual hunger. So that's just what I want to instill tonight into you guys is, is ask yourself a question sometime through the night, maybe the altar call, maybe when you get home, what are you truly craving in your life? What do you truly desire every single day? Whatever that you desire, whatever that you're passionate about, that's what you go after. That's what you attach your life to. If you're passionate about sports like I was, I attached my life to sports and everything that I did revolved around sports. You see it every Saturday in college football season. People fill stadiums and go bananas and most of them's never played for that college football team in their life, but they're so desiring and so passionate about it that they don't care. They'll go and they'll lose their voice. They'll jump when a guy runs a ball across the goal line, but then when they come into a service on Sunday morning, they sit with their hands in their pocket because it's not as much as a desire as the football game was on Saturday evening. There's nothing wrong about football. I love football. But what are we desiring and what are we craving? There's a lost and dying world that we live in. There's hurting people that come in this building every single Sunday and Wednesday. I have, I have friends that I grew up with from a, from, a young, from a young child. I was talking to a buddy of mine that I haven't seen in years that he just came tonight about a few of our other buddies and they're addicted to heroin. They're shooting it up daily. They've lost tons of weight. Their teeth are rotten out. There's a lost and dying world. I gotta take it on myself if nobody else is gonna pray for him. It's a mandate on my life to cry out to Almighty God until something shifts in their life. We can't take the gospel lightly. We can't take it as it's just something that I do on Sundays and Wednesdays. It's got to become a lifestyle. It's got to be something that we desire and that we truly crave to see change in our nation. Our nation is lost. And we, we have to be the light that goes in and says there's an answer, there's hope, and the hope is Jesus Christ. So to desire God is to truly want something so badly that literally you stretch forward everything on the inside of you to obtain what you want. That's what it is to truly desire something. It's literally to be outstretched or stretched forward. Something so fierce that's unyielding desire to obtain something that you have your eyes set upon. And tonight I want to dive in. As I started getting into this, I just I started thinking about Jesus and I started thinking about his whole process through the Bible of what he's done. Again, it's a guideline. There's so much in it, man. And, and it takes me to, you hear this all the time, whenever you go through a test or when you go through a tribulation, you truly know what, you, what you truly, your faith is believed to be in. When you're really going through a season that's crushing, that's when you find out what you're really about. That's what you find out what you're made of. When everything's going smooth and there's no problems and the enemy's not fighting you, everybody's good then. But when it comes to the crushing season, that's when you find out what are you truly about? What do you truly desire? What do you truly crave and have a passion for? 
So in that, I start looking at the word and I said, God, where do you want me to take this thing? Where do you want me to go with this? I don't, I don't have a clue. I just want your will to be done. It's been a prayer in my heart for the last six months. Luke twenty two forty two. God, not my will, but your will be done. It's a prayer that I set aside every single day and I cry out for my life. God, I don't want my will anymore. I did my will. It got me nowhere. It got me two DUIs within a year. It got me sitting in a jail cell and it got me addicted to drugs. It got me with a broken relationship with my family because I lied to them so much that they could no longer trust their son. It got me nowhere. So I said, in that season, Lord, where do you, where do you want me to go? And he just took me to the prayer in the garden. And I don't know if anybody if, if that's here, if you guys went to the Passion Play at Maranatha, did anybody go to that here? A few people. I know there was a lot of scenes in that that, uh, that impacted a lot of people, but for some reason, there was no scene more powerful to me than the prayer in the garden. When the Lord went and started travailing in prayer to the Father, and he told his disciples to watch and pray, and his disciples fell asleep when he needed them the most. And something about that man, I had no clue really about what it was, but it just struck my heart. And it deeply impacted me to the point where I just started d- jumping into this passage and I just started to say, God, I don't want to be the one that falls asleep on you when you need us the most. America is a sleeping giant and the Lord needs us the most right now. What, was, what, what would his disciples done different if they knew the magnitude of the moment that they were in when they fell asleep when he said, I need you the most? What would have happened to their mindset? Would they have stayed awake and contended in the place of prayer whenever he said, I need you here? Because he specifically brought them with him and then brought Peter, James, and John that much farther with them and said, contend in prayer. And you look at the whole passage and he's coming out of, of taking the disciples up and telling them that uh, one of you is going to betray me. <coughs> and in that, he knew that betrayal was coming. He knew that the cross was coming. He knew that. So where did the Lord go? In the most crushing season of Jesus' life on this earth. That's what I want to look at tonight because I said, whenever I was in the most crushing season, what did I do? I turned to the Lord at that point. But Lord, when you were in your most crushing season, what did you do and how can I learn what you did to contend every single day of my life? And he said, look at the prayer at the garden. So if you, if you got a Bible, turn to Matthew 26. <coughs> and it's 36 through 46. I'm going to do a little bit of reading tonight. I don't know how much my voice is going to allow me. And honestly, I don't even know where uh, we're going to go from here. But I'm just going to read what the, where the Lord took me to uh, because we have to realize that when the Lord was in this crushing season, he knew that he needed strength to get through what he was getting ready to go through. So what did the Lord do? He went to the place of intercession and he cried out to Almighty God. What's the church not want to do this, this hour? They don't want to pray. Across America, we can feel sanctuaries of 2,000 and people on Sundays and Wednesdays to hear a good message and to hear a good song. But then if we call a prayer evening, a prayer meeting on a Thursday night at 9 p.m. and go till midnight, you get 10 people there. Right? We have to be awakened. We have to be awakened to the praise of prayer. Why? Because our Father did it. So if He, he did it, why do, we not, why do we think we don't have to do it? He knew that in the biggest season of crushing, in the crucifixion, in the betrayal, in everything that was getting ready to come his way, he knew the only thing that was going to get him through was intercession. And it says in verse 36, (coughs) excuse me, then Jesus came with them to the place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. It's funny, the garden called Gethsemane. Gethsemane means it's an oil press. It's a place of crushing. 
in the crushing is where the anointing is birthed. He had to be crushed to sustain him and what the enemy was going to try to throw at his way. And it goes on, and he said, He took Peter, and he took the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. I believe that he took them because if you go back a few chapters, he then took them on the Mount of Transfiguration, right? So he then showed them himself in his glory. So he said, you're going to go with me and see the glory. So now you're going to come with me to the garden and see me travail and be deeply distressed because you were with me in the glory. So now I need you travailing in prayer with me. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch with me. To watch, we just think, (coughs) to watch is to sit here and just watch somebody do something. That's not what this translating translation is saying. I dug a little bit deeper into the word watch. To watch is to guard and to have spiritual alertness. It's to chase and to be active. So he not only said watch and pray, but he said guard. He said be spiritual alert. He said be active and chase me or else contend for the things of God. So he goes on and he says, he went a little farther and then he fell on his face and he prayed saying, oh my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me nevertheless. Not as I will, but as you will. I I, I challenge you to adopt that prayer. Adopt that prayer every single day. God, not my will, but your will be done, God. If nothing else changes in my life, I don't want my will to be done, but I want your will to be done, Father. Why? Because in the time of his crushing, that's when he found out what he truly desired and what he was truly craving. That, hey, I don't care what it takes, Father. Not my will, but your will be done. He went, to, he went to the garden, not forcefully, but for his free will for me and you to cry out. One translation says in Luke that he prayed in such agony or to be stretched out. That's being desirable of his father's heart. To pray in such a way that, that he's in agony and he is in travail to where his sweat becomes drops of blood. Some scholars say when your sweat turns to drops of blood, you should be dead of dehydration. And he travailed in the place of prayer to say, God, I desire your will to be done and not my will to be done. And I just want so badly for a company of people and a group of people to just raise up in America to say, God, whatever that it takes, I'm going to travail for your will to be done. I no longer desire what it is on the inside of me, but God, I desire you to be poured out. Why? Not for me, but for the ones that we come into contact with every single day. To the ones that, of our family members that are struck out on drugs and alcohol. To the ones of our friends who are sticking needles in their arm. Why? Because we got to contend for them when the enemy has done lulled them to sleep and it goes on and it says this then he came to his disciples and he found them sleeping and said to Peter what could you not watch with me one hour watch and pray lest you enter into temptation the spirit indeed is willing but the flesh is weak What, could you not watch with me for one hour, is what he said. Could you not contend for one hour, Peter? If you look at the whole thing, as he brought his disciples with him to the garden, he brought a company of believers with him, a company of brothers with him, to say, hey, I know they're going to have my back, and they're going to contend with me. But then he left some of them on the outside, And he brought three more that was even closer to him and said, now these three, because if you look back in this passage, he just told the first disciples to sit here. But then he told Peter and the other two, he said, to sit, watch, and pray. So as he gets closer, then the Lord goes over and falls on his face in travail and prayer. 
And we have to understand that in this season that, that the Lord is calling us to the same thing. There's nothing that, he, that He's going to not do and then demand us to do. He went through it in return to say, I need you guys to desire what I desired at the most crushing point of my life. Because I'm about to go to the cross for me and you. What do you truly desire? And he said in verse 41, Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. The spirit of God that dwells on the inside of us is a critical thing in our life. We have to have the spirit of God dwelling, leading us, guiding us, directing us in our everyday life. It's so critical. It's so important because our flesh, our flesh, it, this is a flesh shoot and it's so weak. Our flesh will fail every time. Man will fail. But the spirit indeed that quickens our body will strengthen us to get through it. Whatever that it is, we get through. And prayer is one of the most critical things that we have to instill back into America uh, in this dying, and, this dying and desert age. Because if you look at it, it says, pray, at least you enter into temptation. So if I see a prayerless generation, what's going to follow it? A generation falling into temptation. Why? Because the enemy comes like a roaring lion. Not a roaring lion. He is like that. And he's grazing the earth, seeing who he can devour. So if we have a generation that's not crying out in a place of travail and prayer, I can guarantee you one thing. We have a generation falling into temptation. That's where I was at in my life. When I got into high school, I was a prayerless kid. Yeah, my parents prayed every single day. But me on my own, never. Why? Because they're going to do it for me. Because my pastor is going to pray for me. I'm not, if I need them, I'll just say, pray for me for this, please. Can you? And then I'm going to go fall back into my temptation because I have no strength on the inside of me because I'm building no endurance to try to sustain me through what I was getting ready to face. And I just believe with everything in me, there's a generation a prayer culture that's rising up in this age, in this modern age that's changing things. There's a prayer and worship culture that's starting to raise up. The worship that we just entered into tonight was, was a glorious realm of worship. I was taught about a year and a half ago by a guy named Matt Petrie. I went to a prayer intensive in Kentucky and he said this, he said, worship is prayer and prayer is worship. And I got to thinking, worship is prayer, prayer is worship. If you think about it in the American church, we sing violent songs every Sunday morning. We give ourselves to you, Lord. We give ourselves away to you. Have your way, God. Fill us up. Your will be done, not our will. And we, we, we sing and declare these violent songs. And if you think about it, when you're declaring in the place of prayer, that's all you're doing is declaring. When you're singing worship, you're also declaring. So prayer becomes worship. Worship becomes prayer. They attach their self together. They interlock together. And there's a heavenly sound that's released. I just believe there's a prayer and a worship movement that's rising up. We went to Washington, D.C. Uh, December the 12th. The Lord just said, go to Washington, D.C. and pray. We had no clue what in the heck we were doing. A bunch of hillbillies from West Virginia show up. We go into these subways, these big escalators going up and down, and we're just like, what in the world are we doing here? And the Lord just said, go pray. And the course that he led us on around that city, we went from everywhere. We started out, we, we left uh, Thursday evening. We drove all night. We got there at like 5 o'clock in the morning. We slept for like four hours. We got up and we said, where are we going? And the Lord said, Arlington Cemetery, go there. So we jumped on a subway. We went to Arlington Cemetery. The first place that we showed up was John F. Kennedy's grave site. And if you know nothing about John F. Kennedy's grave site, which I just knew uh, the basics about it, there's an eternal flame. And I seen that eternal flame and my heart melted because there's a fire that needs to be tended on the altar eternally. 
There's a fire that needs to be stoked and be burning forever. And that flame never goes out regardless of the rain, regardless of the snow. The fire is always burning on his gravesite. And I start walking around and start seeing all these passages that, that he's declared over our nation. And it's all about prayer and it's all about founded on God and it's all about this and it's all about that. And I'm sitting here and I'm blown away because I'm looking at the, the one, of, one of the founding fathers of, of, of what we are in in our day and age age uh, and I'm seeing what his heart was all around his tombstone and God just wrecked me and then we went from there we went uh, <coughs> on up and we seen all of the of the military tombstones just ends upon ends as far as you can see of people who've laid their life down for our country so we can live freely and I said God what if, what if, God, if we have an army that raises up for your kingdom and says, God, we're going to go to war for whatever that you need to go to war with. We're going to go into the dark alleys. We're going to go into the dark places and say, God, let your light shine forth. Break these addictions. Break these strongholds. And let the Lord's light shine forth. I said, what if, God, what if that happens? And he said, contend. Contend, desire it, crave it, pray for it, believe for it, stand on it until it comes forth. And then we went to the tomb of the unknown soldier. I'd never really heard anything about it. A guard that stands watch, walking 21 steps one way, turning around to a perfect attention, 21 steps back, never misses a beat, never skips nothing, rain, snow, shine. He's watching. And the Lord said, watch and pray, son. Watch and pray. I'm calling a generation to watch and to pray and to desire the things of the kingdom. We went on through that trip and we ended up going to a, it was something called a rumble. It's in J-Hop, D.C. It's a guy named Matt Lockett. I don't know if you've ever heard of, uh, what's it called? The Right for Life, where they put the red tape on their mouth and they put life across it. And then they stand outside of the abortion clinics without saying a word. Well, he's the guy that founded that. And he's making a difference in our nation. And we went into this prayer meeting with them and we really had no clue about them. We had no clue about anything. And it was just a few of us. And man, there was a connection made. There was a guy that was from uh, California that got up and started kind of sharing, exhorting. And everything that he had exhorted is uh, one of the guys that's, uh, that I'm under. His name's Pastor Bobby Limley. Is pretty much word for word what this guy from California exhorted is what Pastor Bobby had been preaching for the last two months and I'd heard nobody else across the country been preaching this about uh, David wrestling the lion and the bear. And this guy gets up and starts talking about this and literally he preached Pastor Bobby's message without knowing who he was, nothing about him. And we sit there and we were blown away. And the Lord moved that night and then we left that, that thing with a connection and, and just made all kinds of friends. And they said, you don't understand how many people come to Washington, D.C. and say, the Lord sent us here to contend in the place of prayer. He said, we get it all the time. He said, we'll be standing out by the courthouse or by the White House and we'll see these little old ladies over by the side of the building with their oil, anointing, anointing the White House with oil, anointing the courthouse with oil and just shit, sitting over there just praying and just praying. And he goes up and just talks to them. What are you doing? The Lord told us to come to Washington, D.C. and pray over our nation. He said countless times, it's over and it's over and it's over. And he said, the Lord is raising up people to go into those places and contend. We left there, we went to the White House and we prayed all around that White House and, and it was freezing cold. It was two o'clock in the morning. We're out here freezing. I'm in these shoes that ain't built for 20 degree weather my toes are numb I'm trying to click them together warm them up we get on them subways and we're trying to warm our feet up they're like look at these rednecks what are they where are you guys from West Virginia that explains it but glory to God 
we're here to contend. <coughs> but, man, it's just be encouraged because the Lord is doing something uh, in our nation that's going to shift things in our culture. It's going to shift things in our schools. going to shift things uh, all around us in our communities. There's something that's starting to shift and starting to turn, man, and it starts in the place of prayer. If you go back and you research any old school revivals, great awakenings, they will all tell you one thing, that it started in the place of prayer. John Kilpatrick came to Maranatha, and what he said before the Brownsville revival started, that two years before they started a prayer meeting on Sunday night, they would come in and they would worship God and they would pray until wee hours of the morning. And he said, it wasn't until then when the glory of God started showing up at one, two o'clock in the morning when we're laid out on our face praying and travailing to the things of God, then revival came. Azusa Street, it started in prayer. If it's not birthed in prayer, it'll never be sustained. And I just believe, man, there's a company of people that's, that's raising up, that's, that's really grabbing a hold of this and saying, let's do this. Let's pray at all costs. Let that be the desire of our heart, God. Let that be what we crave and we desire in 2015. And let it, may it be a foundation that's laid in 2015 that goes for the rest of our life. I want to I wanna lay a foundation for myself and my family in 2015 that it's paving a way for my son when he gets up. And the only thing that he knows to do early in the morning is to get up and pace and to pray to Almighty God and to contend for the things of God. Normal's not going to get it. Somebody with great talent singing a song's not going to get it. We're the most talented generation that's ever been on this earth. And what's it got us? It takes the anointing. It takes going through the crushing. It takes through going through desiring what the Lord desired. It goes on and it says, Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. I get, I get guys that come up to me. I talk to guys pretty much every day where I'm at, and I get young guys that are just getting saved, and they come up and they sit down and they're like, I'm struggling with this and I'm struggling with that. Why in the world can't I get past this? And the only thing that I ask him, they say, I'm falling, I'm doing this and I'm doing that. The only thing that I ask him, first question, how's your prayer life? Well, it's not where it needs to be. Well, nobody's prayer life is where it needs to be. But how's your prayer life? If you're not praying, that's why you're falling into the temptation. Why? Not because I said it. That's what Jesus said. Pray at least you enter into temptation and, and try to build a prayer culture in your life. Try to build something to where you, you have a time that's set aside every single day, whether it's five minutes or five hours, that you say, Lord, this is your time. I'm going to turn the TV off. I'm going to turn the cell phone off. I'm not going to talk to my girlfriend. I'm not going to talk to anybody. I want to talk to the Father. <coughs> And it goes on and it says this. Again, a second time he went away and he prayed saying, Oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. There it is again. God, not my will, but your will be done. And he came and he found them asleep again. And their eyes were heavy. So he left them and he went away and he prayed a third time saying the same words. Then he came to his disciples and he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand that the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise and let us be going to see my betrayer is at hand. That's a scary passage of Scripture whenever you look at what the Lord had done for them up until that point, instilling things, teaching them, showing them. I mean, you got to think about it. The disciples seen everything that Jesus did firsthand. They seen the lame walk. They seen the blind eyes opened. They seen the blood dry up. They seen the miraculous miracles. They seen the fish and the bread. They seen it. And still, when he needed them the most, and we, 
the, the enemy tries to throw condemnation on us, on our flesh, because he says, you're not doing this enough and you're not doing that enough. I'm here to tell you tonight, if the disciples struggled with it and they walked with him firsthand, me and you is going to struggle with it. It's a battle. It's a battle every single day. I fight for the secret place. You have to fight for it. You have to fight for that place of prayer because that's where the enemy fights him the most. When the Lord, all throughout the Bible, you see Jesus going to the mountain to pray. You see Jesus going to the mountain. You see Jesus going to the garden to get away from everything. He was going to a secret place and he was crying out to God for strength. If he had that secret place, we must have that secret place. And we have to realize that the enemy, when he tempted him, he tempted him in the wilderness, but then he brought him out of the wilderness and took him to the mountaintop. And he tempted him at the mountaintop. And I thought, why in the world would the devil tempt Jesus on the mountaintop? Don't he know that's where he goes to pray to the Father? That's his secret place? And the Lord spoke and he said, he knows if he gets you out of the secret place, he has you beat. Because what did the devil tell him? Satan said, took him up to the pinnacle, showed him all this. If you bow down, I'll give you that. If you compromise in the secret place, take Jesus to the secret place. If you compromise here, you're going to bow down and I'm going to give you everything. Why is it so hard for believers nowadays to get into that intimate secret place with the Lord? Because the enemy knows if he can keep you out of the secret place, he has you beat. That's why it's so critical for us in this season to desire and to crave the place of prayer. Why? Because if you look at that whole passage and you see Jesus and what he did and he went into the place of prayer in the, in the most critical season of his life and then he told the disciples to come with him and pray, then that's the most desirable place for our Lord for us to be in this season and in every season of your life. It starts in the place of prayer. And it's nothing extravagant. It's simply saying, God, your will be done. There's two passages of scriptures that I've adopted. And that one is, God, your will be done and not mine. Luke twenty two forty two, Father, your will be done. And then John three thirty, God, let me decrease so you can increase. The world that we live in is all about ourself. If you turn a TV on, they're trying to promote themselves. They're trying to build us up to be like this person and be like that person. But the word says become the least and then you'll become the greatest. I don't think you can become the least without hitting your knees in the place of prayer and travail. If the Lord become the least there, then we have to become the least there too. And you say, well, how, how is that? Go to Luke, Luke 11. And then I'm going to finish up. I'm going to be done. Oh, you guys are tired of hearing me ramble. <clears throat> thankful for our worship team. I'm thankful for a group of people that comes into a service on a Sunday night and says, More, Lord. More. Why? Why is that a big deal? Why are you dancing? Why do you jump? And why do you sing like that? I did it in the bars for 15 years of my life. I'd close those down. Then I'd try to find the next place at 4 o'clock in the morning. I did that wide open. Why not do this wide open? I refuse to come in and live a lukewarm lifestyle. The prayer that we have to get in our heart, God if my, if my heart's not burning for you more tomorrow than it was today, God, convict my life. You gotta place yourself around people that's gonna challenge you. You gotta place yourself under people that's gonna challenge you. I make it a point in my life to have somebody over me that I can go to and they can challenge me and they can cut on me and they can correct me and they can do, tell me what I'm doing wrong and what I need to do more. Then I got people and brothers that are with me that we pound on each other and we sharpen each other and we say, more, Lord, whatever that it takes, more. 
And then there's people that's under me that what God's given me, I pour into them. And it's the same for you guys. It's the same. You guys have a burning group of leaders in this house. Your pastor is a burning man after God's heart. Your youth leaders are burning men and women. You're fortunate to be raised up in a house that you're in. And you have to have that, that, that unity and that, that hunger to go for the God. <coughs> you say, how do we do this? It's simple. Whenever I first, first got saved, I knew nothing about nothing. I started going to a prayer meeting in our youth group and I was a guy that sat in the corner and literally, this was my prayer. Lord, don't let him call on me to go up there and pray. Lord, please. And I would be in the corner sitting over there trying to hide. And next thing you know, Pastor Bobby, hey, Chris, you think you come up here and pray? No, man. I don't want to come up there and pray in front of y'all crazy people. But the Lord gave a, a desire on the inside of my heart and a passion and a hunger to crave him the way that I crave this world. I used to be a diehard West Virginia Mountaineer fan. Diehard. And I know we got those in here. It's good. I like them too. But I would literally throw stuff at the TV, punch walls. Really? Why am I punching a wall over a game next year? I ain't even going to remember the score of it, really. But the Lord took that passion and that desire in my heart. And I'm not saying he's going to do the same for you, but I ask him to. I still love West Virginia football. I still want us to win national championship. I'm still crushed at the pit loss because it makes me sick to my stomach. But there was a desire that started to shift in my life when I started getting in the presence of God. And it's more, Lord. More presence, Lord. More presence, Lord. And when you start getting presence driven, then the small things start to fade away. Luke 11, I love this passage. It's also in Matthew 6. And if anybody <coughs> who's just starting your walk with the Lord, take Matthew 6 and take the whole chapter and start to mold your life around Matthew 6. It's going to tell you how to pray. It's going to tell you how to fast. It's going to tell you what treasures to put into your life. It's going to shape your life in the way that God intends your life to be shaped. Luke 11 says this, Now it came to pass, as he was praying in a certain place, when he had ceased, that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. I want you to just think about that. They walked with Jesus every single day. Every day they walked with him. They seen his prayer life. And the only thing that they came out and said was, Lord, teach us to pray. And I said, why, Lord? And he just took me back. There's only one reason that when you see somebody doing something, you want to do it. Jesus' prayer life in the secret place was so polarizing, was so powerful, that the only thing they said is, Lord, whatever that you're doing there, teach us how to do that because that's where you're getting through the toughest points. In America today, what do we want? Lord, teach me to preach. Lord, teach me to lead worship. Lord, teach me to prophesy. Teach me to lay hands on the sick. We got to shift that mindset. Teach us to pray, Lord. I'm in a place in my life that I would rather pray than do anything else. And that's a great place to be. But it's also a scary place to be because the things that's around you, you really start to see what starts to surface and starts to be about. You start to see other people's desires and other people's passions. We started a night watch prayer meeting. And we start praying at 7 o'clock, prayer and worship, and we go through midnight. And people say, why do you do that? That's 
stupid. That's crazy. I said, because it takes that. It takes somebody contending. And I want to get so engulfed into a place of prayer to where midnight's not enough. To where it has to go to 3 a.m. and it has to go till 7 a.m. and it has to go till 6 a.m. And you say, why is that? Because there's drug addicts out there sticking needles in their arms at 4 o'clock in the morning. There should be a place where they know where there's a company of people travailing in the place of prayer and worship and they say, whatever that they're doing in there, that's what I need to be in on. So we say, Lord, just do it. Let our lives be so polarizing and so powerful in the place of prayer that darkness literally flees. So he said to them, when you pray, say this. And we have to realize that this prayer is not just a formula for repetition to just say it over and over but it's an outline to be expanded upon. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day by day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. I love how it starts out and it says, Our Father in heaven. If you have a Father in this house, then you've got to have that Father by an intimate relationship between your mother and your Father. You can't have a Father without intimacy. And he said, our Father in heaven. So right there, he's telling us we're to be intimate with our Father. We're supposed to spend time with Him in the secret place. And we're supposed to contend and desire Him more than anything else. And it says, hallowed be your name, or holy be your name. There's also praise attached to this. That's why the prayer and worship culture is starting to come together and do something different. Because normal's not going to do it any longer. And it says, your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we say, why his kingdom to come? Because the earth that we live on, the situations, the circumstances that our friends and our family members are in, they're so in a situation that they have to have heaven touch their situation. I got family members that have to have heaven to invade their life. So chains of addiction are broken off. And I say, yes, Lord, we'll contend until I see change in my family. Yes, I'll I'll contend until I see change in my friends. Why? Because if the Lord did it, why do we not have to? And it says, give us day by day our daily bread. I love that translation because you don't eat today and then not be hungry tomorrow, right? That's why he says day by day our daily bread. If you think back, Matthew 5, 6 says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. To crave, one of the secondary is to crave food. And the Lord's telling us we must crave food, but it must be the daily bread day by day it takes more than just Sundays and Wednesdays it's an everyday contending for the things of Lord for us to see change in America and I can guarantee you that there's change coming to America everybody that you talk to knows something has to change Why is people buying guns and ammunition? Because there's fear on the inside of the heart because they understand that something must change. 
There must be a generation that says, at all costs, Lord, we desire what you desired in the most crushing season that America's ever seen. We desire to humble ourselves and to cry out day and night and to do whatever that it takes to see you rule and to reign on this earth. And then it says, do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And that passage Do not lead us into temptation. The only temptation that we're led into is by our own desires. The Lord's not going to lead us into temptation. The word says in James, Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him, those who have been intimate with him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. The enemy wants to deceive us and tell us this and tell us that and try to get us to fall into this trap and that trap and that temptation and that addiction and this this conversation here and this conversation there and, and look at this person this way and talk about this person that way and he's trying to lull us to sleep he's trying to deceive us and he's trying to get us away from the ultimate plan that Jesus Christ has for our life and the only way that we get through it is the way that the Lord got through he went to the garden and he went to the cross free will but he knew that intercession must take place for him to have strength to get through the betrayal of Judas, to get through the betrayal on the cross, to get spit upon, to get mocked, to get his hair pulled, to get the the, the lashes ripped out of the back of his skin. He knew that he had to desire and he had to crave what the Lord needed him to crave. That's found in the place of prayer. Stand up on your feet this evening. <coughs> I just want everybody in here to just start to examine your own heart right now. without thinking about who's to the right or who's to the left who's in front of you or who's behind you and ask yourself Lord what is my true desire what is my heart's desire is my heart's desire truly to see heaven touch earth is my heart's desire to truly see revival in America For what truly is my heart's desire? Because He's going to show you things in a small areas. He's going to show you things on a larger scale. And as He shows you these things, don't be intimidated. Just say, yes, Lord, not my will in that, that area of my life, but your will be done. going to open these altars up and let's just start to truly rearrange things in our life tonight we're still in January of a new year it's a great time to start rearranging things and adjusting things to line up with what heaven needs us to be lined up to And I just ask you to examine your heart 
And if your true desire for the Lord is to go deeper than you were yesterday, I just ask you to come to this altar and say, God, take me deeper today than I've ever been before. God, show me the small things that I need to weed out of my life. God, show me the large things that I need to rearrange and recorrect. God, show me where I need to be connected to. God, show me what I need to do this very hour, this very day. Come on, hungry people. Start lifting your voice to Almighty God. Come on, let's start releasing a prayer to the heavens. Saying, God, not our will be done any longer. God, we lift our hands and we say, God, have your way in this house tonight. Have your way, God. God, we say, raise up a praying generation this very hour. God, we say, raise up a company of believers who pray without ceasing, God. Raise up that generation, God, that humbles himself before the Lord and says, let us travail to you at all costs. Thank you for listening to this message. For more information, please visit us at faithchristianfellowship.com. Dot com.